what I want to be talking about uh, this afternoon is history and how it impinges on our classical liberal philosophy, and in particular, the uh, historiography of the Industrial Revolution. And I want to say something towards the end about the um, genesis of this wonderful welfare state that the Swedish Social Democrats celebrate so highly. It's a curious fact that um, of all the disciplines, it seems that history, more than philosophy or economics, determines people's political views. We might consider this unfair. We might uh, think that uh, economics has more to say about what people should think about competition and antitrust. Philosophy has more to say about what people should think about uh, natural rights. But in fact, most often it seems that it's history or interpretations of history that will influence the positions that people take. Hayek has, been, has mentioned this. And I think that we can see this in a couple of examples that we ourselves have been exposed to in the process of growing up and being educated. Uh, see if this doesn't uh, seem familiar to you. This is how the story goes. There was at one time a period of unbridled laissez-faire capitalism, or Manchesterism as it's sometimes called. And what happened? Well, then came the robber barons, and the trusts came, and the monopolies, and it was only because, finally, government came on the scene and bridled capitalism and regulated um, the market that the people were, were saved. Uh, and it's this interpretation, more than any studies of industrial organization, I feel, that determine what people think on questions such as antitrust. Here's another example. It happens that even after that period, uh, there was another period of unbridled laissez-faire, somehow, and uh, unbridled speculation on the stock exchange and dog-eat-dog uh, -dog capitalism. And what was the result of that? The result of that was the Great Depression. Uh, and it's only government regulation, and government regulation of stock exchanges, for instance, government fiscal and monetary management that has prevented the recurrence of something like the Great Depression. This is a view, I think, that people have of a certain historical episode that determines their views to a large extent. There are other ex examples that could be selected uh, where people have a certain view of what happened in history and this colors their thinking on the most crucial political questions. Um, many people believe, for instance, that uh, there was uh, a period when, again, capitalism ruled un unrestrainedly. This led to imperialism, a scramble for Africa, exploitation of third world countries. Uh, this, again, to the debit of capitalism, to the, to the debit of the market, as if there were no such things as uh, uh, in the scramble for empire at the end of the 19th century, as if there were no such things as uh, French generals and imperial Russian bureaucrats and Japanese militarists and conniving Italian politicians and uh, British bureaucrats interested in the, st in, uh, the strategic uh, uh, interests of Britain throughout the world and in uh, national prestige. It's all to the debit of capitalism. Okay. Of all the historical interpretations that people have, of all of the historical views that influence their political positions, there is one that has been the most decisive at all, of all. This is the set of pictures that every educated person in the world carries in her head about what happened in England between 1750 and 1850 to the working class. And I say this advisedly, and I think it's the case. Uh, the interpretation itself started in England, but then spread to the continent. It reigns in America and in the uh, schools of the third world also. Uh, something happened there in that period of laissez-faire that was awful and that should teach us a lesson, that never again will we permit this, uh, this horrid, horrid thing called laissez-faire, because we know what it led to. And I would dare say that I am speaking to an audience uh, that perhaps is, shall we say, a little more sophisticated on this question than, than most, than, than an audience I could select at random, right? But nonetheless, you too, I would guess, carry in your head pictures, when I use the phrase industrial revolution, things come into your head uh, un uncalled for automatically, 
that derive from this uh, entrenched historiographical view. I'm leaving aside the few Randians uh, who might, when I say Industrial Revolution, think of, of locomotives and, and, and the glory of man and, and so on. The, the common view, uh, I, I feel sure, is this other one. And uh, to unpackage it a bit, this is how the view goes. Before this thing called the Industrial Revolution, uh, life in England was fairly simple but uh, quite decent uh, for uh, the average Englishman. Uh, one thinks of uh, pink roast beefs and Yorkshire pudding and um, kids gambling uh, among, the, uh, among the meadows. It's uh, really nothing more than a um, uh, working out of uh, the New Jerusalem concept which is implied in William Blake's famous poem that is now a hymn of the Church of England, that England was so lovely in those days, one, one might almost have thought that Jesus walked there. Uh, but what came then? The dark satanic mills. The dark satanic mills. And this is the view, continuing now. This plague that was the Industrial Revolution fell upon the working class of England, uh, battered them into the ground until the time came when enlightened public opinion, demanded government action. The government appeared on the scene, again, like the U.S. cavalry in, uh, in American Western films, tooting the horn and, 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 uh, and uh, charging there onto the scene to save things, plus the labor unions. And then finally, uh, things became decent again. This, more than anything else, has conditioned people's views, I think, on politics. Maybe we're getting a sense of how important history is and why in George Orwell's 1984, uh, one might say this was a novel about history, 1984. Do you remember the phrase, he, he who controls the present controls the past, and he who controls the past controls the future. Uh, this is what essentially is being said, and this is the, uh, the core of that novel, and it's a, a very deep truth. I don't have very much uh, hope in uh, the uh, short time that we have available of really permanently eradicating these pictures you have in your head. I don't think that uh, a generation of scholarship could do that, even if it were taught as it uh, should be at universities. But I would like us uh, for a moment maybe to look at it from a different angle. Instead of that prevailing picture, let us consider let us try to form another picture. Let us try to glimpse what life was, uh, what the world was like in the centuries before this terrible industrial revolution and liberalism, which was its uh, philosophy, came onto the scene. Uh, let's pick a date, 1750. And uh, I've assembled a few very commonly known historical items. I didn't have to research this uh, uh, very much. To, f to give you an idea of what life was like, spiritually and materially, for the mass of people before capitalism and before liberalism changed the face of things. Try to imagine to yourself a world which is compatible with these facts. Uh, and I'm, t I'm selecting these at random, both from the spiritual realm, as I say, and also from the material realm. In 1750, at the University of Salamanca, one of the great centers of learning of the Western world, <clears throat> it was prohibited to teach that the blood circulated in the human body because this was a terrible heresy. And uh, we were very far from any kind of free market in ideas. The authorities ruled over human minds. Indeed, in Spain, there still existed the Inquisition. This world that was replaced by liberalism and capitalism in 1750 was a world where, in the great cities of Central Europe, every night at a given, at a given hour, the Jews re returned to their ghettos. That was the law. They were resident aliens, barely tolerated in Koblenz, in Frankfurt, uh, in Rome, in Venice, Vienna, you would see them go back to their area of town, and that's the way the world was like. In 1740, Frederick II of Prussia called the great 
probably like uh, most uh, politicians who were called the great because uh, he was a mass murderer, um, plunged the world into war. And afterwards, when they asked him why, he said, uh, because I wanted to be talked of. He was a new king, and he wanted to be talked of, very frivolous. And uh, it was possible uh, in this world before liberalism and capitalism to talk of war in those terms. Because liberalism and the liberal ideology had not yet made war into an awful thing. And now to get closer to the individual and his relationship to the material world and the material conditions of his life, to take another fact from this world. Uh, in the year 1732, uh, there was born in a, to a middle class family in England, a man who afterwards became Edward Gibbon, the great English historian of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. And in his autobiography, he says that in my family, several of the boys were named Edward. What happened to the family? They had some crazy Edward fetish. What is this? He said, well, the reason was, uh, of course, obvious, and that is that uh, most of the children were going to die, and uh, Edward was the name of my father, and they wanted to make sure that the father's name was kept by one of the sons. And he says, uh, it may seem a strange thing, but it is in the course of nature that a child dies before his parents. You can find this in his autobiography. And we read that in uh, Sweden and in Norway in those days, the peasants, who of course were the great majority of the people, mixed the bark of trees with their grain to make bread. Now this wasn't any sort of um, yuppie search for increased fiber in their diet. I mean, don't, don't get that sort of idea. It was uh, a uh, consequence of their utter to us unimaginable poverty. We're, we're used to thinking only of dark-skinned people as poor and as miserable as that. Um, and here's a fact I like. I like it uh, comes from uh, the great French historian Fernand uh, Braudel. And much of this uh, increased knowledge of the world before industrialism does come from this uh, school of French historians, the Annales School who make it their business to, to study the fabric of society and not simply what the kings and popes are doing at the top. At the top. And uh, Radell points out that in 1695, it was a terrible, terrible winter. The peasants were starving and freezing and dying in their hovels. And Louis XIV, the palace of Versailles, the, the sun king, Le Roi Soleil, looked down and noticed that the wine had frozen in his glass. Uh, even the king of France could not lead a simple, comfortable life of the sort that's, ex that's enjoyed by the great majority of the people in the West. We read that uh, at the end of the uh, 18th century, a French revolutionary says, happiness is a new idea in Europe. And we read of the emphasis, of course, in the Declaration of Independence by Thomas Jefferson on the concept of the pursuit of happiness. Now, for the first time, it's becoming a possibility that the majority of people, the great masses, could, if things work out right, with the right institutions, with luck, be happy. It had not occurred to people in ages before. This is the world as it has, uh, has it had existed before. And in fact, as I'll mention, a great change is coming over the scholarly world in connection with their view of what things were before and during the Industrial Revolution um, and after. However, the old view, as I said before, seems fixed. Seems fixed at least for uh, a long while. Now this old view, if you think about it, really was kind of a snapshot. Um, that is, what the old view did was say, look, these are the conditions of working people in England in 1820, 1840, whatever. The more sophisticated view takes a different approach. Because it says, for instance, a snapshot can't tell you, a single snapshot can't tell you what change occurred, whether this was better than what had gone before. Uh, and a snapshot uh, uh, can't tell you, uh, most importantly, the, uh, any kind of answer to the hypothetical question, is this better than what might have been? The snapshot cannot sort out the factors. Okay, these people are very poor. 
What caused their poverty? There were other factors working at the time besides the Industrial Revolution, obviously. What causes their poverty? Uh, could it be that uh, part of that miserable condition is due to totally different or even antithetical causes and not to industrialization? Even on the narrow question of did living conditions improve or collapse during the Industrial Revolution, it seems to me, and I can only give you a brief summary of the research, that the liberals, that the liberals have won the case. Let me mention, by the way, that uh, I'm simply amazed. Uh, I think all of the people from uh, the United States and England and other English-speaking countries are amazed here with the knowledge of English of, uh, of uh, the Europeans, so that it won't be a problem if I mention a book in English for you. <clears throat> well, you can see that this is a very good book. It's a small book, but it gives the debate. That is, it, it, uh, it uh, gives uh, big chunks and, uh, and significant excerpts from people who want to downplay any kind of advantage of the Industrial Revolution, who want to insist, no, all in all, it was bad for the working class. But it also gives the other side, those who want to say that all in all, it was an improvement for the British working class. <clears throat> it's a book published uh, in London in 1975. And the editor is Arthur J. Ta Arthur J. Taylor, and it's called The Standard of Living in Britain in the Industrial Revolution, a very straightforward title. And there, you can read in much more detail the sort of things that I'm trying to summarize now. Uh, I can only give you one part of the debate. Uh, uh, fundamentally, but you can read this, you can read other works which are, select, which are mentioned in, in the index, you can either read other works I'm, I'm going to mention, and you can come to your own conclusion. Now, the new research that has been done on this question, the living standards improve or, or, um, or go down, has had its effect even on the opposition. Now, here's an author who is one of the most famous economic historians, uh, who still wants to say, no, capitalism did working people a very great wrong. He's an English historian named E.P. Thompson. Uh, and he has a great famous book called The Making of the English Working Class. And here, it's a very big book uh, uh, dealing with uh, class consciousness and many different issues, but he does, in one section, deal with this debate. And as you can see, what he and his friends are trying to do is to shift the ground of the traditional de debate. I want to quote from him. He says, it is quite possible for statistical averages and human experiences to run in opposite directions. You see that already he's trying to set up this, uh, some, the, the grounds for some kind of concession. A per capita increase in quantitative factors may take place at the same time as a great qualitative disturbance in people's way of life. People may consume more goods and because, become less happy or less free at the same time. Okay, these are wonderful, very true, very true. What is he trying to do here? He's clearly trying to uh, uh, discount the concession that he's about to make. And keep in mind what great concession this is, because this is from the most severe critic you understand all these things are debated. Uh, uh, what, what were wages really? How much did people consume? Uh, what indices are, uh, are examined and so on. So this is the most severe critic of the point of view of, uh, of improvement. And this is what he says. Over the period 1798, 1790 to 1840, notice he selects the, the year 1840, okay, not the year 1850, because that's going to make a difference to his argument there was a slight improvement in average material standards. We are a long way now from uh, J.L. and Barbara Hammond, who set the opinion of a, of, a, of a whole generation and more, the British economic historians, who said the Industrial Revolution fell like a plague on the working class of England. Okay, we're a long way from that. We have the concession that there was, a, there was no collapse of living standards, there was, in fact, a slight improvement. Thompson says, by 1840, most people were, 
quote, better off, unquote, his quotes. I mean, I don't understand why you have to say, put that in quotes. I mean, they were better off, sure. Why don't you just say it? <clears throat> they were better off than, than their forerunners had been 50 years before, but they had suffered and continued to suffer this slight improvement as a catastrophic experience. Well, okay, debatable. That certainly is debatable. Uh, what he has conceded is what all along was the central part of the, of the debate, was the theme of the, con of the contention. And that, what he surrendered, is the question of living standards. Uh, I might mention, this is now the tactic that's being taken. People who want to still continue to attack uh, capitalism say that, okay, okay, living standards, <laughs> as if that were important. Uh, what, right, what, is, what really is important is the network, the tight network of community relationships that existed in the countryside. Uh, what is really important is uh, the uh, sense of independence of a boss, of a working family that uh, tills their own land or uh, works 18 hours at uh, uh, domestic industry, 18 hours a day domestic industry. Those sort of things are more important than mere material standards. The reductio ad absurdum of this is a, an American professor named Iggers, who happens to teach at the University of Buffalo, fairly well known, uh, who wrote on this issue. And he divides the people off on this question of, he, he, it's a hist historiographical essay. So on the question of what happened in the Industrial Revolution, he's examining that. Now the people who think that conditions improved are generally called optimists in the literature. And the others are called pessimists. He calls the optimists the materialists and the pessimists the humanists. Okay? Materialist because they dealt with the uh, living standards. I really wish that Karl Marx or Bertolt Brecht were here to, to deal with that. Uh, uh, somebody scoffing at having enough food to eat as mere, a Marxist scoffing at having enough food to eat as mere materialism. Uh, can you picture what Marx or Brecht would have said about that, uh, the stinging irony of it? Uh, it's, all, it's all turned around now, and it's these vague, uh, so-called humanistic things that they want to make the center of the argument. Now, to return to Thompson, who is a much more significant uh, historian, um, he talks about the terrible living conditions, uh, for instance, these, the slums. And Thompson has enough honesty to admit the following. Despite all that can be said as to the unplanned jerry building and profiteering that went the unplanned jerry building and profiteering that went on in the growing industrial towns, the houses themselves were better than those to which many immigrants from the countryside had been accustomed. Okay. I mean they were awful, they were smelly, they were disease ridden. But what do you think life was like in the countryside? You think uh, uh, rural Europe was uh, the San Joaquin Valley? Uh, and here, Thompson, who has a sense of that, the life of the people in the countryside, yeah, says, yes, it was awful. But do you know, they lived in hovels with thatched roofs, with mice and uh, rats living in the, in the thatch. Uh, he understands that, but that's not part of the picture that you have in your head, huh? What about child labor? As he says, child labor was not new. The child was an intrinsic part of the agricultural and industrial economy before, 18, uh, before 1780. Certain occupations, climbing boys, I think he means chimney sweeps, and ship's boys were probably worse than all but the worst conditions in the early mills. Okay, that puts into in perspective. Children had always been working. Whether children, very young children, should have been permitted to work is a totally different question. It's uh, very uh, much open to a classical liberal to say, no, but below a certain age, a child cannot be contracted for, so he can't make his own contract. But as far as the reality went, children had always worked. And as far as uh, female labor goes, I don't know what people, and people talk about women working in the factories. I don't think, I don't understand what picture they must have of what women have done through history. Since, the, since at least the Neolithic age, most of the work of mankind has been done by women. Don't they know that? The woman first of all worked in the field, then when that was done, had to take care of the kids, bring the water in, make the food, break the, uh, bake the bread, do everything there, right? Well, the guys uh, sort of hung around uh, talking about the, the time they went out hunting, and uh, one guy saying, uh, did you see how I got that mammoth? The other guy said, no, you see how I went and got that mammoth? And they're meanwhile talking there, and the woman does all the work, okay? That's the way to, they think, uh, what, that women have been uh, uh, ladies in, uh, in medieval towers? 
uh, and what the factory did, as it has always done, uh, under conditions of competition and uh, under conditions of competitive capitalism, what the factory did was finally free the woman. As the factory uh, did uh, in America, when the factory system left New England and hit the South, with black women and white women coming to the factory, as the factory uh, system uh, does in the third world countries, now at last she can earn her own income. Now she doesn't have to be under some man's thumb and put up with all his grossness, uh, ev anything he wants to uh, deal out to her. Uh, now she has a certain amount of independence. Now this is then um, Thompson's position. I want to quote from uh, a man who from all evidence takes uh, no particular ideological stance on this, as someone like Thompson is a uh, leftist, as someone like uh, Max Hartwell is um, a believer in the free market. This is a book by N.F.R. Crafts, C-R-A-F-T-S, British Economic Growth During the Industrial Revolution, and it comes from Oxford, 1985. His conclusion, <clears throat> that uh, all in all, in the period in the periods under discussion, uh, the um, data indicate a growth rate of real, wage, of real wage earnings, even allowing for unemployment, of around 0.55% per year from 1780 to 1820, and 1.2% per year for 1820 to 1850. That must be, uh, for the great mass of people, the most unprecedented continuous period of economic growth in history. And I'll mention in a moment that significant, that highly significant difference in the two periods under discussion. The earlier period, a rather slow growth, 0.55% in wages, uh, in the earnings of working people per year. The later pe period, a larger growth of more than twice that amount, and then accelerating later on. Kraft says, living standards did not grow very quickly prior to the 1820s at this lower rate. Nonetheless, on average, they grew. It seems that the most important underlying reasons are to, be, uh, are to do with the economy's inability to, to achieve high rates of growth, or the capital, um, uh, not with, uh, with uh, high rates of growth or productivity, rather than with any tendency of, for real wages to be held below the overall rate of economic growth. In other words, the problem has to do, these, uh, this, this conclusion is that there was growth of wages, not as much as one would have wished. The reason has to do with the general low productivity. And here, we begin to see that there is more to the issue than just the question of, did living standards improve or not? We can go back, check that out statistically to, a, to some extent, come to a conclusion, but that's not, still not the end of the story, because there are other things to be considered. And the most important thing to be considered uh, is the fact, which is emphasized now, by a number of economic historians. The man I just mentioned. And now, okay, Jeffrey Williamson of Harvard University, in a book, Did uh, British Capitalism Breed Inequality? And also in um, in a uh, number of journal articles, has pointed to the chief distorting and contaminating factor, and that was war. War. You think that some of the people who condemned capitalism for the low standard of living of uh, working people might have paid a little attention to what else was going on in the time. In England, and England, let me repeat, is the test case that everybody takes. This is what we talk about all the time. In England, there was war from 1756 to 1763, the World War that's called the Seven Years' War. Then from 1776 to 1783, it's a little matter of um, settling accounts with uh, our British cousins. Then from 1793 to, seven, to 1815, 1793 to 1815, a whole generation of war, the war against revolutionary France and against Napoleon. So that in the, in the first half of this whole period, of the Industrial Revolution, England, at a period of 65 years, England was at war 
for 36 years. And the war against France was the costliest, really the most expensive war in the history of the world up to that time. One might have thought that these historians who talk about why, why, did, why were the working people so badly off might pay a little attention to the fact that vast quantities of money, in those days unimaginable quantities of money, that might have gone into the creation of, of capital, for the creation of consumer goods, were being taken and, uh, as good as uh, uh, a, a metaphor as any, simply thrown into the English Channel from the point of view of anything that was of use to the consumers and to the working people. It was used on boats, on, uh, on, on guns, on shells, to pay soldiers, and it was not available to help people. This is the chief thing that has to be kept in mind. Not only that, but this war was um, financed by a system that was basically a system uh, of steeply regressive taxes. The great bulk of uh, what paid for the war and what paid for the bonds that, uh, of the, for the money that was borrowed um, came from excise taxes. We know something, uh, if we've studied the literature, about some of these, and we know something about the role of taxes in keeping the conditions of working people, living conditions down. If you remember T.S. Ashton in his uh, fine book, uh, The Industrial Revolution, I think also in his essay on, uh, on capitalism and historians, mentions the little fact that when we talk about how bad housing was in the towns in the Industrial Revolution, we might keep in mind that the government levied a tax on windows. The more windows in a house, the higher your taxes. Okay? Now, what sort of effect would that have on the amount of ventilation and light that come, could come into a house? I mean, you don't have to be uh, a, a super economist to figure that one out. There were taxes on the importation of timber from the Baltic. Worst of all, there was the Corn Law. Uh, there was a tax on the importation of cereal into England at a time when bread was the single largest expenditure in the budget of working people. It's hard for us to imagine that, but that was literally the case, especially of poor people. They had to live on cereals. They had to live on bread. Much of it was imported, and um, in 1815, after um, uh, stabilization came, the British aristocracy, the owners of the land of Britain, decided that they didn't want to do away with their windfall profits that had come from uh, uh, being difficult to import cereals during the time of the war against Napoleon. So they levied the Corn Law tax, which was a tax on those who consumed bread. If you want to know about the uh, standard of living of people, as I say, you can't take a snapshot can't simply look and see, were these people miserable? Yes, they were very miserable. They were quite poor from our point of view. First of all, what were things like before? And secondly, what caused that misery? And then the further question comes up, and really in a sense the most important question. What would things have been like if there had never been an industrial revolution in England? What would things have been like for the working class it's very easy for tenured professors to tut-tut uh, about how bad things were. Uh, it's very easy for bureaucrats to tut-tut about the awful conditions in sweatshops um, for the Hong Kong uh, Chinese or for El Salvadorans in New York. It's very easy for them to tut-tut about how terrible things are for agricultural laborers who come in from Mexico and Honduras to work in the United States. So what do they do? They shut down the sweatshops. They uh, patrol the border so the Mexicans and Hondurans can't come in to work in these awful conditions. Right? That's certainly a very great advantage for the Hondurans and the Mexicans and the Hong Kong Chinese, isn't it? <clears throat> so it's very easy for people to say how, thing, how awful things were for the working class. But what would things have been like for the English working class if there had been no Industrial Revolution? We have to consider a very important fact, and that is that England went through a population explosion. The population of England in the period we're talking about increased by something like two and a half percent, uh, uh, two and a half times. Okay? There were millions and millions of Englishmen now to be taken care of somehow, and one wonders how that would have been done in the absence of the increased productivity that came from industrialization. What would have happened to them? 
What would have happened to them? Uh, this is, by the way, the judgment uh, of, a, of another author, um, his, bring, uh, British historian named Edward Evans, again, a book from last year on the um, industrialization of England. Again, a man who was not a liberal particularly. In fact, he attacks the Industrial Revolution. He says it created a good deal of pollution. Now, he's not obviously sophisticated enough to know that pollution is not per se a problem of, of capitalism. Pollution has to do with the uh, uh, vagueness and uh, indeterminateness of, pro of property rights in many cases that permits pollution to take place. Okay, that, but, the, but anyway, that shows that he's not some free marketeer. And he confirms what Ashton already had said, what Max Hartwell says on this issue. Do you want to know what, the English, what would have happened to the English working class uh, with the population explosion, if there had been no Industrial Revolution, then go to Calcutta. Uh, or, closer to home, go to Ireland in the 19th century. Okay. There was a society that increased also in population tremendously by about the same rate that the British did, and they were fortunate enough not to be subjected to those dark satanic mills. Uh, they were lucky. So that, when the potato crop failed in 1845, there was nothing. Ireland today has a population less than half, less than half of what it had at its peak in the 19th century. As far as I know, Ireland is the only country in the world that's gone down in population. Um, what happened to all these people once uh, subsistence uh, agriculture failed them? As Evan said, they've, they've fell right down into the Mal Malthusian trap. Uh, about a million died of starvation. Another million immediately emigrated to America and England and other places. And more emigrated as time went on. So that this, in a sense, is the crucial question. Not what actually did absolutely historically happen. Because a large part of what happened was not the result of the Industrial Revolution, but of other things, for instance, the war. The question is, what was the net result of the Industrial Revolution? And here, I think uh, one could say uh, the case is really closed, uh, except that is the net effect of industrialization, not the question of the actual living standards, but the net effect of industrialization, except for a few diehards, I think the verdict can be said to be in. <clears throat> and that is that uh, the Industrial Revolution, to put it in our terms, historians don't generally talk in uh, superlatives, the Industrial Revolution was the greatest blessing that could have occurred to the British working class. It saved them from the horrors that non-industrial societies had to undergo under the same circumstances. Finally, <clears throat> uh, our knowledge of the meaning of the Industrial Revolution has been immensely deepened by studies of what life was like before. Here I can mention another book by Neil, Neil Hedrick. Hedrick, another British economic historian, <clears throat> The Making of a Consumer Society where he says, when we read of what life was like before the Industrial Revolution, when we uh, read about the, uh, when we read of the fact that purchasing a garment or purchasing the material to make a garment was an event that a working person could expect to experience only once or twice in his or her lifetime. When we read of the fact that the clothes of plague victims were fought over by their relatives. When we read of the pitiful inventories of the possessions of working people, where a, a, a man will bother to mention a chair with only three legs, three pieces of cracked china. It's, in a way, it's kind of heartbreaking that this uh, is the result then of a, of a lifetime of, of very hard labor these few pitiful possessions. Um, when we read of the sickness, the threat of their lives, when we read of infant mortality, then the difference the Industrial Revolution made 
to mankind becomes evident. And just uh, a few, uh, a couple of hundred years after that, after this enormous change in uh, the course of mankind that was brought about by industrialization and by laissez-faire, just a relatively short time after that, you have uh, social democratic and uh, commie professors teaching their students that uh, the greatest horror in the world is to die of boredom in a consumer society. Um, okay, this then what was, was what was occurring, this change in the material conditions of life accompanied by the change in the spiritual conditions of life, which I sort of implicitly indicated by my examples at the beginning, a greater freedom uh, for the individual in his, in his religion, in expressing his point of view, in learning about the world, uh, together with the uh, greater dignity and details that comes from having a certain amount of comfort and affluence. This is what was occurring in, uh, in England, and then in America, and then in Europe in the course of the 19th century. As time went on, it could not be denied any longer that uh, things were improving for working people. Meanwhile, something else began to happen. Not among the English, but among another European people, also quite conspicuous. And uh, this other development was to have the greatest of consequences. The people am among whom this happened was the Germans. There began a reaction against liberalism, against laissez-faire, towards authority, towards the state, and with all this, the invention of the welfare state. I speak of the invention of the welfare state, and I will be speaking of its inventor, as Professor Gordon Tullock has emphasized, we can, in this case, pinpoint the inventor, and his name was Otto von Bismarck, the uh, old Junker, oddly enough, was the inventor of this sleek, streamlined, modern, uh, wonderful thing. Now this, in a sense, goes against what is uh, sort of the consensus of uh, views very often among historians of uh, social policy, as it's sometimes called. They want to say that the welfare state is a reaction to the logic of industrialism, or somehow inevitable. Two British uh, historians, uh, historians of social policy, have uh, published a number of very interesting articles about this. John Carrier is the name of one man, uh, Ian Kendall the name of another man, and you read journal articles all the time uh, if, you, if you're in that kind of business. It seems to me that their articles have, have made a difference, have made a difference in my thinking. Their point is, is that there's a kind of bad faith involved in that approach. Uh, what people who talk that way want to say is that somehow what happens in human affairs is an automatic, mechanical reaction to external conditions. Uh, they, um, uh, they, they want to say that there was no choice involved in the matter. It's sort of like a flow of a, of a current of a that uh, basically cannot be stopped. One uh, well-known historian of social uh, welfare even goes so far, if they have this kind of point of view, thinking of an inevitable progress, to talk about some countries as welfare state leaders and other countries as welfare state laggards. Okay, this is in wertfrei, value-free science, right? Uh, when you start with the assumption that somehow industrialism, per se, produces a welfare state, um, they have a different kind of approach. They think that these questions are often, and uh, to a large extent, the result of human choice. So that we want to examine the conditions of choice and the people who made these choices. As they say, the social problems of industrial society are, first of all, never self-evident the supporters of the standard view seem to ignore the possibility that the development of welfare activities could result from the purpose of action of members of society. They also point out what creates a problem. How is a problem, how does a, pro a social problem become a problem? Does it, is it obvious, does it come with a label that says it's a problem? There are certain p people who argue, perceive, want to maintain, want to convince you that that's a problem. Why is one thing a problem at one time and not at another time? You understand? 
it doesn't make it it doesn't make itself obvious as a pro problem it has to be accepted and taken to be a problem and there are people who do that who do the taking and the labeling of that as a problem <clears throat> uh, if the uh, social welfare le legislation were an inevitable reaction to industrialism and to the industrial revolution then it is very hard to understand why it should have originated in germany and not in england and england only taking it up decades after the germans did whereas England was the first industrial power and much more highly developed than the Germans. And it's also, as these gentlemen point out, uh, very hard to, uh, to understand, and as others have pointed out, why social welfare legislation should have appeared in Ecuador and Brazil and Ethiopia before it did in the United States. Um, one doesn't want to, uh, to be insulting towards developing and struggling nations, but still, when all is said and done, they are... They were uh, hardly as advanced as the United States in industrialism. So how come the welfare state, on the federal level at least, only exists in America from 1933 on, and already had be become accepted in very backward countries? It is a question of, um, of decision. It's a question of human choice. And let us examine, what I want to do is uh, direct some attention to this uh, inventor of the welfare state. Who is, who is this Bismarck? To put it uh, most briefly, I would say he was a catastrophe of world historical proportions. He was a man of great political genius, perhaps the greatest of the 19th century, placed in the service of state power. And I would say parenthetically that until the Germans realize this and acknowledge this and come to terms with it, one still cannot be certain about the Germans. I was uh, depressed to see that just recently they celebrated uh, an anniversary of Frederick the Great, whom I mentioned before, the man who plunged the world into world war so that he might be talked of. And the president of Germany, I think he's a uh, Christian Democrat, and thank God, not, not of the small party that calls itself liberal, which would be the ultimate irony, uh, gave a speech praising uh, Frederick the, the, the II. Uh, and whenever the Germans talk about these things, what they want to say is, uh, please, please, he wasn't uh, this guy or that guy. He wasn't Hitler. Please, don't think he was Hitler. Okay, he wasn't Hitler. My God. I mean, imagine if there were another Hitler. Uh, but when one searches through uh, German history, it's um, interesting the threads that can be found. Someone like uh, Frederick II, there is the constant steady emphasis on the uh, supremacy of the state and the subordination of the individual. In any case, uh, as far as Bismarck goes, as I say, if they simply continue trying to apologize and trying to say that he's not Hitler, not very much is going to be accomplished. In, uh, who was this man? Well, in, 18, in the 1860s, there was a, a great constitutional struggle that was going on in Prussia, which was by far the largest of the German states. This was a struggle between, on the one side, the uh, self-aware middle class, led by the German liberals that had formed themselves into the Progressive Party. On the other hand, uh, on the other side was the, well, the Junkers, the uh, landowning class, the, and led, of course, by the uh, Prussian monarch, happened to be William the uh, First at that time. And the struggle was over uh, who was going to rule in, Ger in Prussia. Was it going to be the monarch uh, through his uh, appointed chancellor, or was it going to be parliament? And in particular, who was going to have control of the army and the army budget? Was it going to be the king, or was it going to be parliament? Uh, it's... Um, hard to get back into the spirit of those times, but uh, imagine to yourself if you want, if it doesn't sound like a uh, paradox or contradiction in terms, an almost revolutionary German middle class. They were on the point, it seems, of revolution, at least that's what the leaders thought. Um, they thought at the time had come to give in, or, ex or if not, then William I would go the way of uh, Charles I and of Louis XVI. The German middle class seemed to be really serious about this and they had growing power at this time. Their last ditch hope was an old Junker who had been in the diplomatic service for a long time, considered uh, very reliable. Nobody understood how smart he was. 
named Bismarck. And at the last minute, Bismarck was made chancellor. Instead of giving in to the liberals, instead of compromising, the last hope of reaction and absolutism was Bismarck. He was called in. And um, uh, the man certainly had arrogance, didn't give an inch to these businessmen and their liberal representatives. Uh, he'd said in his uh, first speech before the uh, Landestag, uh, I'm, cons I'm interested in the unification of Germany, that's the end of my heart, but it's not going to be done. The unif unification of Germany, which is our great hope, will not be accomplished by resolutions and democratic votes. That was the mistake of the revolution of 1848. German unity, when it comes, will be achieved through blood and iron, through blood and iron. And this phrase stuck to him, and it's not a, an unfair representative, a representation of what his value system was like. Well, to put it briefly, Bismarck broke the back of German liberalism. It was their last hope, and Bismarck, at this time, the struggle, victory in the struggle, and Bismarck robbed them of it. Through a series of three brilliant wars and the diplomacy that uh, provided the context for it, he achieved what, unfortunately, to many liberals turned out to be more important than a free society. He achieved a unified Germany. And from then on, for the next two decades, he always had that trump card to play in his opposition to the liberals. He was the founder of German unity. And who were they? They were professors, they were journalists, they were bankers, they were nothing. Nothing compared to the glorious uh, achievements uh, of uh, Bismarck. He founded unified Germany, and he Prussianized Germany. He made it into a state which had a parliament, which had a certain amount of freedom of expression, but where the ruler and his appointed chancellor were still in, in control, where the, where the people were not so much citizens as subjects. Now, in the last half of the 19th century, the condition of German workers was improving as the condition of European workers as a whole was. The chief reason for this was the creation of a, in those days, vast free trade area among almost all the German-speaking people, called the Zollverein, or the Tariff Union, and the advantages which economic theory and experience demonstrate come from such a free trade area. It was a uh, question of the general loosening up of society in the direction of the free market. They did away with guilds, there was a free movement of people throughout the whole country, free entry into uh, all professions, and the result was what we could expect, together with steady capital accumulation, a law of incorporation that uh, favored people pooling their stock and joint stock companies. All of these changes that occurred brought it about that uh, little by little things were improving. And for a while, Bismarck allowed uh, the uh, liberals, now mostly tamed and docile, to change Germany along these lines. Then, at the end of the 1870s, a change occurred. The first thing that uh, happened in 1789 was that Bismarck moved Germany away from protectionism, uh, away from free trade and towards protectionism. He brought about an alliance between heavy industry and the Junkers, the, the landowners, protecting both of them at the expense of working people and the consumers. Um, the argument that was used uh, then was a very silly argument, which I'm sure has been used uh, in every European country, and that is, free trade is only, good for the is only good for the English. You know why the English went over to free trade? Because they were ahead, and they wanted everybody else to level their tariff barriers so every country in the world would, would be flooded with British goods. That's the only reason they're in favor of free trade. Typical, hypocritical English. And this argument, by the way, you'll find very often, not just uh, in the old pamphlets of, uh, of nationalists, French and German and other nationalists, you find this actually in history books. This view does not explain why, famously, when England began to uh, decline relatively as an industrial power, when Germany and America overtook England, the British stuck to free trade. Okay, and in a famous election, decided for free trade against protection as late as 1906. This doesn't explain why the British only gave up free trade under the pressure of the Great uh, Depression in 1932. If they had only wanted free trade in the beginning because they were ahead and they thought it was advantageous to them, then why didn't they give it up once, they had, once other countries had passed ahead of them? The reason? Well, because the English liberals had done their work very well. 
and not only the middle class, but the English working class understood that free trade was in the interest of consumers and that they would be spiting themselves, they would be harming themselves to set up tariffs. Nonetheless, the Germans bought this argument and protectionism came about, had a domino effect, the age of free trade was over. Nobody realizes the uh, kind of uh, seeds that are planted by something like this. As Leonard was uh, talking about the other day, uh, people think that they're only putting up protective tariffs. People don't realize they're also ha changing things in the other country. The Smoot-Hawley Act had disastrous consequences for American consumers. It also had the consequence of convincing many Japanese that the only chance to survive in this world was now to, to carve out an empire of their own and to go the militaristic route. Um, one of the consequences of the Bismarck tariff was a bit the beginning of alienation and hostility with Russia. The Germans and the, and the Russians uh, had been uh, friendly for quite a while, Bismarck friendly towards the Russian government. Now the, the, the Germans are excluding Russian wheat. Russian wheat can't get into the German market. This certainly adds to the, to the, to the hostility that afterwards uh, snowballs, other uh, factors come into play and you have 1914. But as another part of Bismarck's program, uh, what he does is come up with the concept of social insurance. Afterwards, he's gonna also add to this package not only protectionism and social insurance, but colonialism and imperialism. <clears throat> this is truly the invention of the welfare state because now the state is not saying, as it has said for a long time, we will provide for the indigent, we will provide for paupers, the state is saying we will provide for all working people, or afterwards we will provide for all the people of society. So that you have now an important change of principle. <clears throat> Why did Bismarck do this? Well, first of all, uh, he personally had been for a long time an opponent of the new industrial system, did not like to see the old uh, craft guilds replaced by the factories, uh, he has uh, statements that come from uh, the earlier part of his career where he t sounds like some British Tory talking about the, the terrible factory system, the creation of a new proletariat uh, that is being exploited by the capitalists. Uh, he says, nobody is ever hungry in the great estates of, uh, of Prussia where I come from, where they looked after by their, by their protective uh, lord and uh, the, the ruler of the estates. Those people are not hungry. Those are happy farm folk. The only hungry and miserable people that we found in the factory town. So he was a man who was at odds, you might say, with the new world system. But more important than that, he first of all had an immediate political aim, which was to combat the social democrats. And beyond that, and uh, most of basically, he wanted to tie the working class of Germany to the state. He wanted to create a kind of symbiotic relationship where the state looks after the working people and in return they give to the state a humble obedience and gratitude. The uh, issue comes up then in 1881 when he proposes his first accident insurance bill. It's very interesting to note by the way that before he did this he had had long conferences with German industrialists with the representatives of German heavy industry. And you'll find this, you find this in the history of the United States. I'm not sure, to a degree in the history of England. I'm not sure about other countries. But there's the cloven hoof of corporate capitalism very often there at the beginning of these social insurance schemes. We're talking about accident insurance now. What had existed was a liability law dating from 1871. And many of these industrialists did not like the fact that first of all, their workers could haul them into court over some accident that occurs at the job and prove in court it was the boss's fault and I have to be compensated now by the boss. They didn't like that. They also were aiming at, with a state subsidy for this insurance, uh, to socialize the costs of accidents in heavy industry where most of the accidents occurred. So that one can find in the history, early history of the social, legis uh, the so social legislation, a name such as Karl Ferdinand von Stumm, who was uh, called uh, the Baron of the, Tsar, of the Tsar area, coal and steel. Why is somebody like this interested in social insurance and pushing for a welfare state? To a degree, he had a self-interest involved. 
and uh, this was important in getting some of the votes that pushed pushed the, uh, the bill in. Uh, Bismarck proposed a compulsory insurance scheme for uh, accidents where one-third was to be paid by the worker, one-third by the employer, and one-third by the state. It was to be administered by the state. Bismarck said no private insurance agencies. He said no dividends from human misery. Um, as if, of course, the landed aristocrats didn't make dividends or profits off uh, the scarcity of uh, food, huh? But uh, you see here the kind of deep animosity towards capitalism and towards a market way of earning a living that was typical of an aristocrat, such as Bismarck. The whole ideology that was involved was uh, highly significant. Um, Bismarck hated, even more than he hated the socialists, the liberals of his time, because he thought they were a greater threat. He didn't think the socialists were going to be that much of a threat. Okay, this is the great conservative talking. See, you might try to think who this reminds you of. Uh, this is in a private conversation that was later recorded. The Progressive Party, that is the Liberal Party, and its clique of Manchester politicians, the representative of the pitiless money bags, has always been unfair towards the poor. They have always wanted, to, to the extent of their powers, to hinder the state from protecting the poor. Laissez-faire, the greatest possible self-government, lack of any control, opportunity for the absorption of small business by big capital, for the exploitation of the unknowing and inexperienced by the clever and the cunning. The state should be merely the police, especially for the exploiters. Um, that's uh, the sort of thing one can find among German nationalists and conservatives and right-wingers all the way up to Joseph Goebbels. This hatred of, uh, this very particular uh, special hatred of capitalism. To the point where Bismarck entered into conversations with the leader of, uh, secret conversations with the leader of the German socialist Ferdinand LaSalle. What Bismarck wanted to do was what Napoleon III had done to an extent in France, what other conservatives in Europe in the situation were, were toying with. The idea of a coalition between the old traditional elite, the monarchy and the landed aristocrats on the one hand, and the masses on the other, both against the middle, the middle class led by the liberals. Which is one reason why Bismarck, when he sets up his Reich, introduces universal male, uh, male suffrage which was uh, very unusual for Europe at that time. All the people, all the masses of people, peasants and workers, have the right to vote. Bismarck did not hesitate to go so far as to call himself a state socialist. He said, state socialism will win through. Whoever grasps it will grasp power. State socialism, not worker socialism, not revolutionary so socialism, but socialism from the top down. So this were, the stage was set a little over a hundred years ago, for the first conflict of two world views on, this, on the first proposal for social insurance, the first element of the welfare state. The liberals were ready, and they made a heroic stand. There was Ludwig Bamberger. These names are all forgotten now, but maybe they deserve to be m mentioned sometimes. Ludwig Bamberger, what will, one of the representatives of German Jewry, who are a mainstay of German liberalism, what will be the, uh, sorry for keeping interrupting myself, but uh, also a translator into German of Bastia. What will be the limit of state intervention? The great question is whether in the place of human individuality, of self-determination, of the free initiative of citizens who are of age, should be placed the supervision of the police and the providing hand of the state. This is, uh, he says this is reminiscent of the last days of the Roman Republic, where the state showers benefits or pretends to shower benefits on the people. Uh, another leader of the uh, German liberals, Eugen Richter, who was the Bismarck's most bitter opponent, a really uh, a man I think that most of us would like very much. After I leave here, I'm going to be uh, traveling down to the south of France by way of Germany. <clears throat> and when I'm in Cologne, I will take a bus trip to Hagen. And I think I will probably be the first person in a long, long time to go to Hagen specifically to see the statue of Eugen Richter, who was uh, for many years the uh, member of the Reichstag from that town. Uh, he fought against it all. He fought against the law, against the socialists. He fought against the laws against the Catholic Church. He fought against the protective tariff, against colonies, against the uh, big uh, naval bill 
that put uh, Germany and England on a collision course that was going to lead to 1914. Uh, they said about him that he was always against things. I, I like uh, politicians who are always against things. <clears throat> Some of his arguments were, uh, as our arguments might be, pragmatic arguments, sort of utilitarian or consequentialist arguments. He says private insurance companies are always going to do it better. Uh, they're also going to have a special interest in seeing that accidents don't occur so that they don't have to pay, uh, pay off. Uh, he says we have private insurance companies that are blossoming now. We have mutual self-help associations for workers. They're going to be killed when the state uh, steps in and takes over everything. Um, he says, he, he spoke to Bismarck and the conservatives and the Reichstag. He says, that is the fundamental difference between the conservative and the liberal party. You conservatives overestimate the use of force, the influence of the police, while on the liberal side there is a preference for voluntary action. And then in his major speech, he warned, as Bomberger had warned, that this was only the first step. It would open the door to the principle that the state is now responsible for alleviating the inadequacies of society. It would counteract the growing sense of individual independence in society. Bomberger had said very perceptively that we are now taking a step which will be of the greatest consequence for Germany and perhaps for the world. But um, the liberals uh, were defeated. <clears throat> Bismarck in this was aided by a group that was coming to influence in Germany called the Socialists of the Chair. Uh, the Cateta Socialisten. That means the chair in the sense of a, uh, you know, professorial chair, an endowed chair. They were professors. And they were so socialists of the chair as against the Marxists who were the socialists of the street. Uh, they were men like Gustav Schmoller, who said that any follower of Adam Smith is unfit to hold a chair of economics. Um, I remember years ago, Schmoller was a, was a special bet noir, a special uh, uh, hobby horse that Mises used to ride all the time. At the seminar at NYU, every once in a while, Mises would uh, talk about Schmoller, and you could see his eyes sort of blazing with <laughs> suppressed hatred from generations back. And we thought it was kind of funny. I mean, uh, how can anybody get excited by an old dead German professor like Gustav Schmoller? But then uh, one, one learns things as one gets on, and I think one sees what Mises had in mind. Uh, the consequences of someone like Schmoller and the things he taught and the domination of the school in German universities uh, were much worse than the consequences of some maniac uh, killing somebody in the street. The main influence they had was to work on public opinion, the direction of state responsibility, the direction of social insurance and the welfare state, and also particularly on the opinion of the German civil service itself which for a long time had been liberal, being convinced of the greater efficiency of the market, not for any particular free freedom ideas per se, but had been liberal. And now these professors, through their associations and through their books and articles, beginning to work on them. These German socialists of the chair and their successors, innumerable professors of sociology and social work, and social policy in all the universities of the world. Remind one of what an American sociologist named Alvin Gouldner what Alvin Gouldner wrote in his book on the coming crisis of Western civilization. There's a chapter on the welfare state and he says this, there are continuing pockets of resistance to governmental intervention by the way, he's no, he's no libertarian, he's a uh, kind of Marxist-oriented man. But he sees social reality with so, some clarity sometimes. There are continuing pockets of resistance to governmental intervention, partly in consequence of the higher levels of taxation required to finance it. The state, therefore, does not only require a social science that can facilitate planned intervention to resolve certain social problems. The state also requires social science to serve as a rhetoric to persuade resistant or undecided segments of the society that such problems do e indeed exist, that this is a social problem. This is the famous social problem you've heard of. That so such problems do exist and are of dangerous proportions. 
Once committed to such interventions, the state acquires a vested interest of its own in advertising the social problems for whose solution it seeks the financing. He points out, of course, that this then becomes a kind of professional relationship. Social science that talks about this, social science that points out social problems and the need of the state to come in, is very well funded by the state. And uh, we have in Germany not only the creation of the welfare state, we have also the first um, middle class college educated beneficiaries, the uh, German professoriate. Well, finally, although uh, thwarted for a while by the liberals, Bismarck has his way. In the 1880s, liberalism is dying out in, in Germany. The election of 1884 is catastrophic. They're, they're decimated. Uh, and uh, finally, a, a coalition of uh, Catholics, that is the Catholic Center Party and conservatives, pushed through the legislation, sickness, insurance, accident insurance, finally old age insurance. Germany was now in place to act as a model for the rest of the world. And it became such a model. This is one of the important things that's happening in the subconscious mind of uh, Europeans in the last decades of the 19th century. The growing perceived relevance of Germany, the, gro the growing power of Germany as a model, it's something that the Italian philosopher Croce referred to. Uh, England, America, France, these were uh, no longer considered the, uh, the most modern, up-to-date countries. For much of Europe, especially for Central Europe and for Eastern Europe, Germany took that role. But also, but also for intellectuals in the Western countries. For American professors, for the English intellectuals, Germany had this role of being the advanced in the modern country. And Germany was inevitably and understandably tied in with the values of power, of the state, of centralized authority, and of government welfare programs. Um, when England, when the time comes for England to accept wealth, the welfare state, starting in 1911, under the uh, a liberal government, so-called, the Asquith cabinet. One of the men who's pushing for the welfare state is a young English politician named Winston Churchill. He's for what he uh, calls a policy of social organization in emulation of what has been done in Germany. Thrust a big slice of Bismarckianism over the whole underside of our industrial system, was his advice to the prime minister. It would not only benefit the state, but fortify the party. Very typical of Churchill, again, <clears throat> looking for the political advantage. Other places could be mentioned also as pursuing the German model. I don't think it's unfair to say that it was part of Bismarck's aim to lock the working class and then all the rest of society into a kind of perpetual childhood such that even when the time came that society became immensely more wealthy, there would be no way to get rid of the system of government social insurance. The assumption was that the provision for illness, for accident, and for old age would always be the business of the state, would always be arranged for, for the people through compulsion. There would never come a time when working people people at large could arrange for these needs for themselves and voluntarily. This was a part, a crucial part of Bismarck's vision of the good citizen. A good citizen was one who was bound by feelings of love and gratitude to the state. He acknowledged his own personal inadequacy and he acknowledged his need for the state to look after him in his time of troubles. They would never come into existence an independent human being standing on his own feet, making his own decisions. And that's what Bismarck wanted. It seems that that's what he's achieved. I want, um, finally, to uh, draw to your attention a prophecy which uh, came about about 50 years before Bismarck undertook the creation of the welfare state. 
It was uttered by a great Frenchman, Alexis de Tocqueville, in the last uh, pages of the second volume on democracy in America. We looked into the future, even in his own, that was a great thing about de Tocqueville, his uh, sense, enable us to sense something in the air, even though no one else could sense it. This is what he thought might happen, might very well happen. <clears throat> uh, above this race of men, the members of society, stands an immense and tutelary power which takes upon itself alone to secure their gratifications and to watch over their fate. That power is absolute, minute, regular, provident, and mild. It would be like the authority of a parent if, like that authority, its object was to prepare men for manhood, but it seeks, on the contrary, to keep them in perpetual childhood. For their happiness, such a government willingly, willingly labors, but it chooses to be the sole agent of that happiness. What remains but to remove from individuals any need to live their own lives, any need to think their own thoughts? Thank you.